We had stopped the last time at chapter 16, verse 79, and we'll continue from verse 80. And we are talking about samadhi and sleep, deep sleep. And the question was that is it not possible to attain samadhi as we sleep? Wouldn't that be easy? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But that's not possible, as King Janaka explains to Ashtavaka. Verse 80. In Samadhi, there is only pure consciousness. In deep sleep, consciousness remains dormant. Diversity is seen in the waking state. But in Samadhi, only one absolute reality exists. Throughout, self-illuminated Atman is one and the same and always remains free from affliction. Therefore, it is said to be pure consciousness. Samadhi and deep sleep last for long periods. So when a person comes out of those states, he remembers them. But the moment of perception is so brief that one does not have time to become familiar with this naturally arising state. If samadhi and deep sleep were as brief, these states would also remain unfamiliar. In daily life, samadhi and sleep can be experienced for a few moments, but because of prolonged deep sleep, the wise can differentiate between sleep and samadhi. Those who cannot differentiate between the two cannot understand the difference. O Brahman, every human being experiences these moments, but because he is unfamiliar with samadhi, he does not even notice them. So that's a very interesting comment. Everyone experiences these moments, but if he, he has a momentary experience, and is unable to really register this because it's unfamiliar, he doesn't know it. So a lot of us are experiencing these what are called fleeting samadhis and yet we do not know it because we do not know what samadhi is. We are unfamiliar with it. So when these states would last longer, we would remember them and we would learn to recognize that state. Okay. What was that somebody trying to ask a question? I was not too sure what that was. Seem to be some sort of sound. For anybody who would like to ask a question, you can unmute yourself and ask. If you have background noise, you can write in the chat. Please ask questions or put your comments in the chat to everyone. It is not possible for me to respond to private messages since I cannot... Uh, conduct this discussion and at the same time respond to private messages. So please use the general chat uh, for messages and you can share your thoughts there or if you have any questions. So we were talking about Samadhi. Vijaya just joined in. And... Um, we just talked about deep sleep and samadhi. And deep Hi, sleep... Radhika. So deep sleep is also a state of unawareness, you can say. It is a state where we, most of the times, do not have any recollection of this. If we would have a recollection of deep sleep, we would actually be in a state called Yoga Nidra. And it is a state similar to Samadhi. 
The only difference is that in Samadhi you're really awake and have this experience. And in deep sleep you are sleeping and yet you are awake. This may sound very confusing, but as this text says, since you have not had this experience very often, you cannot differentiate between sleep, samadhi and waking state. These are all states of consciousness. To continue reading from verse 87, Samadhi is a profound experience of desirelessness. Such a state is also experienced in sleep and sometimes in the waking state also. These experienced states are not considered to be Samadhi because all samskaras remain latent therein, ready to manifest. Similarly, instantly one sees an object which is untainted by deliberation. This is similar to Samadhi. Let me elaborate further. Listen reverently. The unmanifest state of the self-existent reality reveals that there is that there existed nothing, neither day nor night. It is called sleep. It is a dormant state of consciousness. Everything remained unrevealed, for there is nothing to be revealed. Experience of the void is deep sleep. Here consciousness remains dormant. During the waking state, one consciously recollects the experience of nothingness that was experienced during deep sleep. Thus, consciousness united with the knowledge of the unconscious is called sushupti, deep sleep, whereas consciousness shining in samadhi is identical to Brahman. So now we are trying to understand what is deep sleep and what is samadhi. Deep sleep, when it is experienced with awareness, one can recall when one wakes up that experience of deep void. When you experience samadhi during the waking state, it's a different experience. But you experience that same state, the quality is different. In waking state, the consciousness shines forth and that is Brahman. And when you have that experience one time, you will not forget it. This all may sound very esoteric. You have to be patient and just go through certain parts of the Tripura Rahasya. And let them sink in. You may not understand it. You may not be able to grasp this and integrate this all at one time. But we just let it sink in. And over time, the unconscious mind would process this in a, in a manner that helps you gain some insights. Not all of the text is so esoteric. There will be parts that are much more interesting and practical as well. Consciousness united with the knowledge of the unconsciousness. Unconscious is called sushupti, deep sleep, whereas consciousness shining in samadhi is identical to Brahman. So, unconsciousness in deep sleep is called sushupti and samadhi is when in full waking state we experience this deep, pure consciousness within and that is Brahman or Samadhi. Verse 93. Consciousness experienced in Samadhi is beyond time, space and the awareness of nothing. The light of lights engulfs all darkness and pure consciousness alone exists. How can that power be the cause of deep sleep? Therefore sleep is not the ultimate of goals. Thus King Janaka removed the veil of ignorance of Ashtavakra. So, deep sleep is not the goal. 
a lot of people had this misunderstanding that we can just sleep ourselves to enlightenment because there are no desires in deep sleep. So can we just not be enlightened if we stay in deep sleep? But while deep sleep is a state of desirelessness, it is not full of awareness. We are basically unaware at that time. And the desires are a bit like little seeds. They have not germinated. It's like they've gone back to the seed and they are now in their seed form. But they are very much there. It's just that they're not active. In our last session, I talked about Aladdin's magic lamp. If you may remember, some of you, you were there. We said there is a story of Aladdin. It's from the Arabian Nights. And there's a magic lamp. And when Aladdin rubs the lamp, a jinn comes out, a genie, and he can make all the desires come true. So this state of deep sleep is a bit like that lamp. And when you rub it, <laughs> what comes out are dreams. And in these dreams, we fulfill all our wishes and desires. What we cannot fulfill in the waking state, we fulfill those desires in sleep, in our dream state. And then these dreams and desires go back into the lamp, into the magic lamp, or what are seeds, known as samskaras. And so the samskaras are nothing other than seeds of desire that we all have. And they are the cause of our being here in this plane of existence to live out these samskaras. Any questions about this so far or any thoughts or comments? Uh, did you want to ask a question, Vijaya? I thought there was some background noise, so I muted you, but you can unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, actually I have question. Uh, one question. Um, uh, are you able to hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So we're talking about deep sleep. Um, so in deep sleep, uh, so, so our, um, I mean, we are totally shut down to any uh, of the uh, thinking process. So in that process, uh, so uh, what I experience is when I have deep sleep, uh, I feel uh, morning. I feel uh, very refreshed. Um, so my question is, um, uh, deep sleep is important. Then again, uh, coming to the other part of the sleep, is that also? Oh, you said that that is also required. Yeah. Which other part of sleep? You mean dream? The, the dreams, yeah. Yes, yes, that is naturally required. We need to mm -hmm. have our dream time because that's the time where we process what we have experienced in the waking state and we fulfill those desires that we are unable to fulfill in our waking state. So certain desires, as you know, as we live through our life, we are not able to get everything we desire. And what do we do with these desires? We end up getting very frustrated, right? And so somehow we are working these out in our dreams. So that dream time is actually a very important aspect of therapy. A lot of people require that when they are not able to live out their desires, sometimes due to circumstances in the external world and sometimes due to a lack of courage. A lot of fear and insecurity prevents them from living out their desires. If somebody, for example, has a dream to be uh, an actor, an actress, you know, and uh, but it's not got the courage to do that because, you know, it's a lot of insecurity. It's difficult and... Um, 
there are a lot of factors. There, it's not a steady nine to five job where you get a salary. So, what happens if you know you're not successful? So these fears prevent this person from living out that dream. And so, as just an example, such a person might have dreams of being a famous actor or actress, and mm-hmm. is able to live out these desires in the dream. If you would not let this person sleep, that means this person does not get dream time. Then it ends up having you will end up having psychological problems because that frustration is not being able to is not integrated and at the same time you are not able to live out this desire due to insecurity and a lack of courage so this causes terrible conflicts in the mind and leads to a lot of disturbance and, and turbulence and turmoil and such a person can fall seriously ill Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, okay. so both uh, is required. Yeah. Both is required. Here, of course, we are t- we are t- not um, discussing, uh, shall I say, the psychological aspects, but we are trying to understand the process of the mind. We are trying to understand how awareness functions, how the mind is set up so that we learn to understand ourselves. Yes. So we get to know ourselves and our own desires and uh, the reason why we are here on this plane of existence and what is our goal in life? What is our purpose? Why have we taken this form, this body? Why are we here? Um, what, is, what is the reason for being here? And these are these are, you know, existential questions, and that's why we okay. are trying to understand the nature of the mind and the process through which we can gain greater self awareness. Thank you, Vijaya. You can mute yourself so that we don't have any background noise. Survi has a question: What is the goal of Yoga Nidra? Well, I would first like to clarify the question itself. Yoga Nidra has different meanings to different people. For a lot of people, Yoga Nidra is a a technique. And in this technique, they practice visualization of all kinds. Visualization practices of Yoga Nidra are exactly that. They're just visualization. You can sit and visualize anything you want and you will remain at the level of the mind. In a, in a way, you'd say that would be like a dream state because you're working with pictures. Then there is the technique of Yoga Nidra which leads to the state of Yoga Nidra. Now, in this technique of Yoga Nidra, there may not be necessarily much visualization, but it can help to bring you to the state of Yoga Nidra. So, what is the state of Yoga Nidra? The state of Yoga Nidra is when you are in deep sleep, but with awareness. Every night when you go to bed, you enter a state of dreaming, and then eventually deep sleep. And in that deep sleep, you remain unaware. You do not know you are in deep sleep. You do not know that you are existing in deep sleep. You have no awareness of yourself. But when you enter the state of yoga nidra, you are in deep sleep, and you are aware that you are in deep sleep, and you are aware that you are existing. So this is a very fine difference and if you've not experienced the difference you may not quite understand it but one is a tamasic state a dull state that is where you enter every night in deep sleep and the other state of yoga nidra is the same state but now you have entered it with awareness and that is yoga nidra 
So what is the goal of Yoga Nidra? Now, if you, the goal of the Yoga Nidra technique is to enter the state of Yoga Nidra and experience deep sleep with full awareness. And what is there in deep sleep with full awareness? You will find there is nothing. There are no thoughts. There is nothing because all the desires have gone back into the seed form. And so when there is nothing, what is there? there's nothing, then there is pure consciousness. For those of you who attended the last session, we talked about it and we said that to attain the goal of self-realization, you actually don't need to concentrate on anything. All you have to do is withdraw your attention from everything that's external and you will naturally go into this deeper state of consciousness and therefore in yoga nidra consciousness shines forth so the goal of entering the state of yoga nidra is to experience consciousness pure consciousness but samadhi is an even higher state of awareness because in samadhi you experience that same pure consciousness in full waking awareness. Like right now, we are having this discussion. In that same moment, imagine you would not experience pure consciousness. That would be samadhi. So I hope that this is a clear distinction and even though you may not have the direct experience you know the difference now is yoga nidra is entering the state of deep sleep consciously and in samadhi you enter into pure consciousness in waking state otherwise it's basically the same Okay, we go to the next chapter, which is chapter 17, the method of sadhana explained by King Janaka and the analysis of self-realization. O Parshurama, I will tell you the further questions Ashtavakra posed after listening to Janaka. Listen attentively. Ashtavakra asked, Ashtavakra is now continuing. For those of you who have joined us uh, today, the conversation is between Ashtavakra and King Janaka. And this is actually part of the story that's being narrated by the great teacher Dattatraya to his student Parshurama. So the, the two are, are talking and the story of Ashtavakra and King Janaka is being narrated. The story is actually a dialogue. So Ashtavakra asks King Janaka, Please explain with full details the varieties of momentary samadhis. When do those highest states of realization occur? The warm-hearted king responded. A short comment here. We talked about momentary samadhis in our last session. We said fleeting samadhis. These are what all of us have experienced during our life, maybe as children or as adults, in moments of relaxation, extreme relaxation. It might be you, you went for a walk and in the night, in the cool breeze, there was a full moon, and that moonlight, you experience suddenly this feeling of connection with everything around you, with all of nature. And that moment was a, a fleeting samadhi. So there are times when, when this sort of comes to you in moments of of calmness, contentment, and you have this little insight. 
And when the insight is a little bit more intense, you will not forget it. But if the insight is very mild, very transient, very brief, then one even forgets it because you are not able to recognize it. You do not appreciate its value. You know, the saying goes that to understand the value of a gem, you must be a jeweler. Because only a jeweler knows the true value of a jewel or a gem. So when something beautiful like a fleeting samadhi happens, most of the times we are not able to recognize the value of this because you have not experienced it for longer intense periods. So you don't know the value of it. And then it's washed away. It's washed away. It's forgotten. But as you get these more often, you begin to think, oh, wow, that's great. You know, I, I, I've had this before and it seems something wonderful happens here and I want to have that happening more often and longer. And that's when the longing comes to experience this wonderful joy, this limitless joy, this amazing feeling that you have, this beauty that you experienced in those few brief moments. And when you have that longing, you start looking for either some sort of techniques, some teachings, a teacher, something which helps you understand what happened and how can I continue to grow in this process. So some of you have found the lectures of the Tripura Rasya on my channel on YouTube, like Sohasya says. And why were you listening to that at all? Something must have happened that made you look for these things. And that is probably a fleeting samadhi, these moments. Some people, of course have taken to the spiritual path because they have experienced a lot of suffering. But there are a few who have come to the spiritual path not because of suffering, but because of the longing, deeper longing that they have for having tasted this bliss, having tasted this nectar, and wanting more out of a kind of a greed, but a positive form of greed, wanting more of this amazing nectar for I find no other word to describe it other than that and Janaka gets warm hearted when he hears this why does he get warm hearted he gets warm hearted because all teachers love these kind of questions they love good questions and they love students who have this deep longing in them and so Janaka warm-hearted he responds O Brahman listen I will tell you about the momentary samadhis occurring in daily life when a lover embraces his beloved for the first time he is not aware of what is going on within and without yet he is not asleep that is a kind of awareness similar to samadhi O sage when a sadhaka suddenly fulfills a burning desire at that moment, he doesn't remain aware of anything within or without. Though he is not under the influence of sleep, that also is considered similar to samadhi. When a mind is free from all thought constraints and a person is walking cheerfully and unafraid, suddenly a tiger or some other fierce animal appears, for a moment he loses his outer and inner awareness, yet he is fully conscious. That momentary state is also similar to samadhi. So wonderful examples given here which tell us what samadhi is a bit like. That intense moment of passion when two lovers embrace for the first time, you forget everything else. And yet you're fully aware. That intense awareness 
is similar to samadhi. It is not samadhi, but it's very similar to samadhi. Have, I'm sure all of you at some point of time experienced a desire which goes, you know, which is fulfilled, maybe unexpectedly, or a deep desire manifests. I experience this sometimes when, you know, I see little children who, who long for some toy, you know, they have a deep desire for this toy and then they're longing for it, they're saving money for it or whatever. And then suddenly this toy is gifted to them, maybe by the parent or somebody else. And when they hold this toy in their hand, they have such joy in their face, their eyes shine, they light up. That moment that desire is fulfilled is a wonderful moment. And in that moment one forgets everything else. And it's that moment, a very brief moment of desirelessness. Because that desire was fulfilled. So that short moment you experience desirelessness. Very brief. But that's what it is. A sudden contentment descends on you. And another example given about a tiger appearing suddenly. What happens there? A moment of extreme danger. In extreme danger, all our senses become fully alert. Our awareness is so heightened. Such intense awareness that is similar to samadhi. It is not samadhi, but it is similar. So we can experience this kind of Samadhi, fleeting samadhis, throughout the day, quite often, but we just do not recognize the importance of these moments. Any questions about these, these examples given so far? In verse 10, 11, and someone suddenly hears that his beloved son, who was healthy and successfully carrying on his family responsibilities, has died. For a moment that person loses his internal and external awareness and yet is fully awake. That state of sudden shock is similar to experiencing a moment of samadhi. So, do we recognize a pattern here? In the first example, it's extreme joy. In the second example of the desire being fulfilled is an example of also, you could say, extreme joy. In the example of the tiger and the sun dying is a state of fear or extreme sadness. So extreme fear, extreme sadness, extreme joy and also extreme pleasure give us an idea of what samadhi is like. Because in all these extreme situations, we are fully aware and we are fully present. Any thoughts or questions about these? So King Janaka continues, in verse 12 he says, Listen, I will explain Samadhi in many ways. There are moments of transition between waking, dreaming and sleeping. Those moments are experiential and similar to Samadhi. Just as a leech moves from one grip to another, the sadhaka should watch the functions of mind during these moments of transition. You know what a leech is? A leech is like a little creature that that uh, sticks or grabs onto something. You can think of also a caterpillar which moves from one leaf to another. These are moments of transition, right? When you're going from one leaf to another, 
at some point of time, you're on both the leaves, right? The, the caterpillar is on both leaves then. He is moving from one to the next one, but a caterpillar cannot just jump from one to another. He goes slowly, and at one point of time, half his body is on one leaf, and the other half is on, on the second leaf. So that's a moment of transition. And here, the transition we are referring to is the transition between waking and dreaming, the transition between dreaming and sleeping, deep sleep. And once again, the transition between deep sleep and dream state, and the transition between dreaming and waking. You may have all experienced this very briefly. When waking up in the morning, you suddenly start becoming aware. You're sometimes partly still dreaming. You may have an image or two. And as you start waking up, you become aware of, the, of your room, the world around you. And you're partly in dream and partly in waking state. That's a transition. This can happen also while you're falling asleep. If you're a little bit aware, you may catch yourself falling asleep. It's always a little bit more difficult to observe this transition while falling asleep. It seems to be easier to catch this transition while waking up in the morning. Now the transition between dreaming and deep sleep state is far more difficult to catch. For that, one needs to be a slightly more advanced meditator. And if you have had moments where you have spotted this happening, where you have seen the dreams come out of deep sleep, then you will know why this example of Aladdin's magic lamp is so perfect. So these transitions also have names, just like we have name like waking state, deep sleep and uh, dream state. So the transition between waking and dreaming is called unmani. Unmani is a bit like having not, no mind, not really a mind at that point of time. Man is mind. Unmani is like absent-mindedness. But it's like this sort of, you know, your attention is no longer really focused and then you start dreaming. So that state or transition is called unmani. The transition between dreaming and samadhi has got a very interesting name. And this transition is called Aladini from Aladdin's magic lamp. I can well imagine that the yogis had heard the story of Aladdin and the magic lamp because in those days the relationships between India and the Arabs was very strong. They were had a lot of trade and a lot of things from India went to the Arabian countries and India was very famous for all its riches at that time, spices and silks and all sorts of goods and maybe in return we got some nice stories from the Arabs and the most famous one of them is Aladdin and his magic land. Or perhaps it's even possible that the story was originally Indian. I don't know. But it's interesting that the Aladdin's magic lamp works so well for this state of deep sleep where these wishes and desires, they come out and play themselves out there in the dream state. And if you are able to watch that transition, you will spot it. You will spot your samskaras getting active. And it's a fascinating process. So King Janaka continues. He says to Ashtavakara, You are endowed with a keen intellect. In this regard, amidst worldly activities, 
intelligence seems to be segmented. That intelligence differs from moment to moment according to its activities. The pause between moments can be considered sim similar to Samadhi. Remember Ashtavakra. Those who have profound knowledge of Samadhi are in Samadhi all the time. For them, every moment is Samadhi. For the ignorant, Samadhi does not exist any more than a rabbit's horns exist. <laughs> Here is one of those amazing images from the Tripura Rasya. The Tripura Rasya is very famous for these images. You know, these amazing images that it creates when it describes uh, different states of consciousness or different um, ideas. And it talks about ignorant people who have never experienced this or have never recognized it. And for them, Samadhi is like a rabbit's horns. Well, we all know that a rabbit doesn't have horns. They don't exist, right? And so, for these people also, Samadhi is simply like a rabbit's horn. It just doesn't exist. It doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, those who talk about Samadhi, who have a profound knowledge of Samadhi, they are in Samadhi all the time or they've had very intense, long experiences of Samadhi. Hearing this, Ashtavakra again asked, O King, if in worldly activities one, everyone experiences moments of Samadhi, then how does the world continue to function? In deep sleep, consciousness remains unmanifest. Therefore, the sleep state cannot be used to attain Samadhi. Moments of Samadhi are experienced in the waking state, but they are not able to lead a seeker to the real state of Samadhi. The highest state of Samadhi is the direct experience of pure consciousness. Then how can human beings able to live in the world and conduct their worldly duties. After attaining the highest state of samadhi, ignorance is completely dispelled. Such a state of samadhi liberates and bestows pure knowledge. That samadhi occurs naturally in the instant between two thoughts. So why are people still in bondage? O oh, King, O oh, Lord of Kings, please help me resolve this doubt. So, Ashtavakra asks a very good question, which, in fact, a lot of people on the spiritual path, people having a sincere desire to attain self-realization, have often asked that if I attain self-realization or I experience samadhi, Will I be able to continue living in the world? Will I be able to function in the world? So, the king replies in verse 24. O Brahman, listen, I will tell you the greatest of all deep secrets. From the beginning, the world continues to function because of the darkness of ignorance. These pleasant and painful experiences are there, and all creatures experience them, like they experience a dream. Removal of ignorance is possible only through pure knowledge. To remove ignorance, one needs to have profound knowledge, which can be brought into use during the waking state. That knowledge, which helps one to attain the highest state of samadhi, will not be helpful in conducting worldly duties. Just as the surface of the mirror is the foundation of all its images, self-existent knowledge stands behind and supports all that we experience. That knowledge which arises from desirelessness is pure knowledge. That state in which one experiences any desire is the lower state. 
to realize the value of ignorance with its currents and cross currents is also a kind of knowledge. And that is seen in the cause and effect and in all forms of the world. So, before I continue, I would like to comment on this briefly. That knowledge which helps us attain the state of Samadhi will not be helpful in conducting worldly duties. Now, this may sound like this is either this or that. It's either or. Either you go for the path of Samadhi or you conduct worldly duties. That's not quite the case, though it may sound like that. It's just that that knowledge which helps you attain Samadhi is not going to necessarily help you attain success in your worldly activities. But we can still combine the two because self-realization itself is the foundation. The self is the foundation, so self-realization gives us expand, expanded awareness. This pure knowledge is useful. It helps us to live in this world. If we learn how, how this, so to say, ignorance or how this world functions. So understanding the value of this world is also a kind of knowledge. You see the cause and the effect. And so it is also useful in some way. But not directly. The techniques used for self-realization are, are different. And you will need to have a different kind of focus for that. So verse 30, to realize the value of ignorance with its currents and cross currents is also a kind of knowledge. And that is seen in cause and in effect and in all forms of the world. It's an important statement that ignorance also has some value. This world exists and we are here to live out our samskaras. And therefore, it does have some value. Verses 31 to 33. Not being able to realize the self-existent reality is the cause of ignorance. Self-existent reality is complete in itself because it has no limitations. It is beyond time, space and causation. Ignoring the body, senses and the mind, to be the self is also a function of ignorance. Sorry. Considering the body, senses and mind to be the self is also a function of ignorance. Unless this ignorance is dispelled, worldly bondage is never broken. Without profound knowledge of Atman, it is impossible to break this bondage. So you see, the ignorance is thinking that the body, the senses, all that is Atman. And while in a, in a certain aspect, it is pure, all pure consciousness, we identify with the mind or the senses or the body and that is the ignorance. Knowledge is twofold, direct and indirect. Indirect knowledge is received from scriptures and instructions given by the preceptor, by the teacher. But these are not means for attaining self-realization. Indirect knowledge is accepted on mere belief. It cannot bestow freedom. 
direct knowledge dawns when samadhi is attained. So that's a very good line. Two forms of knowledge, direct and indirect. And indirect knowledge is what you're learning from scriptures. You may have a teacher, you listen to your teacher's guidance, whatever the teacher is teaching. And this is all very useful. But this is not direct knowledge. You can say it is second-hand knowledge, book knowledge. These days people um, like to get their knowledge from websites and on, uh, on the channel, like we have our channel, on YouTube and other sources. But whether it's in a book form or whether it's in the form of a website or in the form of a video, it is still indirect knowledge. It is not direct. So there's only one kind of direct knowledge. That direct knowledge, internal, direct experience of pure consciousness is samadhi and that is the only real, true knowledge. And when samadhi is attained, then one also attains pure knowledge and the same knowledge is able to liberate the aspirant. So, only direct knowledge has the power to liberate. From the Shiv Sutras, verse 1.2 says, Janam Bandha. Janam Bandha means knowledge binds. So a lot of people get very confused because they say, hey, knowledge is supposed to free, liberate. How can knowledge bind? What kind of scripture is this? What does this mean? This is what it means. Those who like to do intellectual studies, they like to read and discuss and have debates, they are, they are bound and they will be bound and remained, remain in bondage. They will not be liberated because that kind of knowledge can, has no power to liberate. The only knowledge that has power to liberate is direct knowledge, wisdom through direct experience. So I think this is a very good place to stop. Are there any thoughts, questions before we end the session? Or has everybody already reached the state of thoughtlessness and desirelessness? That would be nice, wouldn't it? So let's stop here and we continue next Saturday, same time. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.